Okay, so we have uh, uh, completed uh, John chapter four, and we have seen um, how Jesus ministered in Samaria, how Jesus ministered to the nobleman, and what the result of that ministry was. We've understood the power of the word of God. We have understood um, that when we believe. Right, so in the kingdom of God, uh, our faith is very important. When we believe, many things can take place, uh, and we have we can experience the glory of God. And in this manner, Jesus worked, okay, uh, and did his miracles. He did his uh, wonders. So I just want to show a map, um, just for us to have an idea of where it is that Jesus has been moving around and you know doing his work. So that'll that'll give us. Uh, you know, it will sort of come alive to us. So let me just quickly share my screen with all of us. Okay, yeah, even Prince is here. Good. So now we can. Okay, I hope you can see it. Are you able to see? Yes, ma'am. Okay, see. wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so just have a look here. Uh, you could, uh, like, you know, you can see the some cities which you're familiar with. You know, we know all these names. So I'll show you. See, below is your Judea, like this portion is Judea. And then as you go up, we said that in Judea, Jesus is having a little bit of opposition. So he moves towards Galilee. So Galilee is on top. Okay, so over here it is Galilee. They have not written it, but I'll show you in another map. Uh, can you see Galilee? Where are they? Uh, Galilean ministry. Galilee is on top. If you go down, it is Judea. It, this whole thing is Judea. Okay, so that's how uh, the places are. So Jesus mainly like over here, Judea, Jerusalem, going to Jerusalem. Um, you know, for for the feasts and the worship and all. This is this is uh, how Jesus. This is where Jesus was. So in Judea, he didn't have like you know a, a good response. So when we studied about him moving towards Galilee, uh, we said that he went through Samaria. So to go to Galilee, he has to go this way. Here is Samaria. Okay, and we, we said that there is a city called Sichar. That's where he met the woman at the well. So from Judea, he goes to Sichar. He goes through Samaria. Okay, goes through Samaria. Uh, he goes to the region of Galilee. And when he goes to Galilee, he goes to Cana, the same place where he had done a miracle earlier. And we talked about the nobleman who came. So the nobleman, it was... He heard, oh, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming, right, to Cana. So from Capernaum, he travels to Cana. And he comes here to meet Jesus. When he speaks to Jesus, Jesus says, I can't come. You go. Your son is healed. So he goes back. And he finds his son healed. So this, these are the regions which we have looked at so far. We have seen. Judea, then Galilee, and then you know Jesus going through Samaria. Okay, so that gives us a good picture. Every whenever you know, once in a while, we'll come back to the map to see. But now you know you have a nice idea. Basically, Jesus is walking. Okay, he's walking around. So first few chapters, we know how the map looks like. Okay, now let us just continue. Yeah. So now coming to uh chapter five so towards the end of chapter four we read that jesus did the second sign he came out of judea into galilee okay so he has come to the galilean region which i've already shown you okay over there he comes to a place called Bethesda. Let me see if I can show you Bethesda. Huh, yeah. Let us have a look at this also. It will make your understanding better.
था सो गैलिलियन रीजन केना कैपनवर्म बेतिस्टा यू नोटिस सो बेतिस्टा इज ओवर हियर सो ही हैज मूव नाउ फ्रॉम केना ही हैज कम टू अ प्लेस कॉल्ड बेतिस्टा ओके ऑल राइट सो नाउ लेट अस सी व्हाट ही डज इन बेतिस्टा सो इन बेतिस्टा there was a feast okay there was a feast which was going on um so jesus went up to jerusalem he went to jerusalem now there uh, in jerusalem by the sheep gate at pool um oh okay so sorry this says uh, the pool of bethesda it doesn't really say bethesda in jerusalem uh, in jerusalem um by the sheep gate a pool which is called in hebrew bethesda having five porches okay so this is in jerusalem uh, sorry for my confusion so he is not in bethesda but you know there's a pool of bethesda in jerusalem where uh, you have sick people okay who have been laid so the sick people would be laid there what kind of sick people we find they were blind lame paralyzed uh, they were all waiting for the water to be moved because by by um, tradition okay they they knew that there was something like an angel coming and moving the waters and whenever the pool waters were stirred if someone could step into the waters then they could be healed so the sick people would come and they would wait for the for the time when the water would be stirred so at this time there is a man with an infirmity infirmity means sickness okay he has an infirmity and how many years has he had the infirmity we are told 38 years 38 years he had an infirmity and when jesus saw him lying there um that he already knew jesus already knew that this man was sick for many years he had a condition for a long time and he looks at this man and he asks him the question do you want to be made well okay so you see for god right uh is our situation not good enough for god to know that we are in need even the noble man he came desperately to jesus but you find jesus telling him you know i know you people are looking for signs and that's what you want from me he gets a response like that because ultimately what is it that jesus is looking for he's looking for faith and he found when he found faith in the noble man the miracle took place now this man at the pool of bethesda okay not bethsaida bethsaida is different this is pool of bethesda okay i'm just correcting myself again sorry for the confusion uh, pool of bethesda in jerusalem in jerusalem and it says there was a feast of the jews so some people uh, uh, say that it is probably a passover because for three main feasts the jews would go to jerusalem so it could have been the passover that jesus went to attend and if you study the gospels and you see how many passovers there there were people try and use that to calculate the duration of jesus ministry so from this passover if it was a passover to the time when jesus was crucified apparently it was 3 3 and a half years so that's how they come to the conclusion that he did his ministry for about 3 or 3 and a half years so at the pool of bethesda uh, there is this sick man and looking at the sick man jesus wants to find faith in his heart so he asks him the question do you want to be made well obviously he wants to be made well no wonder he is lying at the pool of bethesda how did he get there we don't know maybe he heard about the angel stirring up the water and uh, he asked his family members or friends to come and put him there so however whatever the way in which he got there he got there and 
Jesus understood that this man has been sick for a long time. So when we are sick or uh, you can apply it in other context also, maybe mm, we are going through something in our lives and it's taken a long time. What are some common uh, challenges that we could have? If we are trusting God for something and it's taking a long time for it to happen, what are some common challenges that we have in our heart? Come on, I'm sure, uh, you know, we've had some such experiences. When you're waiting on the Lord for a long time, what are your common emotions, common thoughts? Okay, Kiran is saying walking by faith when people don't recognize, yeah, that is sad, right? It's tough, so you're walking by faith. Maybe this man also, he thought he'll get healed, but 38 years, he's still waiting. Okay, Dave is saying sometimes you get doubts. Very true, yeah, we, we struggle, right? So there could be doubts in our hearts. Then? So if Jesus asked the question, do you want to get well? Okay, Kiran is saying confusion. How about disappointment? Yeah, disappointment. Aran is saying giving up, disappointment, discouragement. So he is at the pool of Bethesda, but how strong is his hope? How strong is his faith? Most likely, there could have been a mix of thoughts and emotions. So maybe that is why Jesus wanted to check, you know, what is the level of his faith? So he asks him, do you want to be made well? You have been sick a long time. Jesus understood that. So he's asking him, really, really, do you want to be made well? Uh, you know, after this long wait. So the sick man, he answers Jesus and he says, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. So he's giving an excuse. So that may show us that maybe he did not have enough faith. He's giving an excuse for why till now I have not received the promise. Till now I have not been healed. Uh, you know why? Because nobody is helping me. Okay. And I'm so, or in other words, a victim mentality. I'm a victim. Before me, other people get into the pool, they get healed. So poor me, I'm still here, you know, 38 years and I'm not healed. So, you know, it really shows us the attitude of the person. But how, what is the attitude of Jesus? You know, Jesus looks at him. He, Jesus listens to his excuse. And Jesus doesn't waste any time. He understands, oh, this man, he does not have any faith. But Jesus still ministers to him on the basis of his faith. And he says, okay, please don't explain all this unbelief to me. Straight away, Jesus goes to the point. He says, rise, take up your bed and walk. Okay. And I'm sure this man does not even know that this is Jesus. Because if he would have known Jesus is talking to him and asking him, do you want to be made well? He would have said, yes, Jesus, make me well. I heard so much about you. He does not even know Jesus, meaning he does not have faith. But Jesus, on the basis of his faith, tells him, take up your bed and walk. You know, and the Bible talks about a gift of faith. When there is no faith, there is a gift of the Holy Spirit called as the gift of faith, which is released. Okay, and when the gift of faith is released, then people receive a miracle. And this situation seems like the gift of faith situation where Jesus checks, uh, what is the temperature of the faith? Zero, zero degrees centigrade. But 
Jesus says, okay, no problem. My faith is 100 degrees centigrade, right? So I will just go ahead and, you know, uh, release my faith. So, so re he releases his faith and he tells that person, rise up, take up your bed and walk. How is it possible? Somebody, 38 years, this man has not walked and Jesus is quickly saying, get up, take up your bed and walk. In those days, the bed that uh, Jesus is referring to, it's not like, you know, our cot, like a wooden cot, heavy, carry that. It was just like a mattress on which people slept and they rolled it up. So it was just that bed. So we see immediately the man was made well. So the faith, the gift of faith was released to him and he just stood up. How, how much time? 38 years sick, immediately he got up at the word of Jesus and he walked. It says so amazing, right? Amazing miracle. Till now, we have seen so many miracles. All of them are amazing. This one is so amazing that, you know, something that has not worked for so many years has worked. So it's, it's miraculous, miraculous recovery. And that day happened to be a Sabbath. So when the Jews saw that a man was healed, they got upset. They said, it is not lawful to this man who got healed. They're saying, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed. Okay. Now, this man who got healed, he answered to the Jews and he said, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. I just did what that man told me. I didn't think that today is the Sabbath. So the Jews they ask him, who is this man? How come on the Sabbath he's telling you to take up your bed and walk? But obviously this man did not know. So he tells them, I don't know who this man is. One man came to me and told me, so I did it. By then, Jesus had actually gone away from there. Yeah, gone away from the pool of Bethesda. Uh, because there were lots of people okay, who, ha who had gathered there. Later on, Jesus finds this man who was healed and he tells them, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Okay. So a couple of things here. You know, we notice that uh, this man who was healed, you know, sometimes what happens? Healing takes place, but there can be a root or a root cause or uh, um, a reason why that sickness came about or in the case of an oppression, there can be a root cause, maybe an unforgiveness or maybe a, a sinful habit. There can be something which is in the core of why that sickness or oppression came on our lives. Now, it's not always the case. Okay, it's not always the case, but sometimes this could be the case. And in the case of this man, looks like there was a root cause. So, receiving a healing, while it is wonderful, Jesus also knew that for the long term, to keep the healing, the man had to deal with something deeper. Okay? So, you see, Jesus is concerned about the person living an abundant life throughout. Jesus is concerned about the health of this person, spirit, soul, and body. So he's telling him, don't sin. Again, please don't sin because what will happen is something worse can come upon you because sin is an open door for the enemy to play havoc in our lives. So maybe in the case of this man, there is there was a sin which opened the door for the sickness. And Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he knew that. And he did not want this man to go back into sin to experience worse things, okay? And we also know when we talk about, uh, you know, like uh, demonic oppression, we know that once a person is set free from a demon, Jesus encourages that person to walk strong with the Lord, to have a strong walk because otherwise what will happen? The seven more demons which are, you know, more powerful than the previous one, they will come and they will try to reoccupy 
that space or the person's life so jesus understood this particular context and he wanted to minister complete healing to this man and that's why though the experience of healing was real he took up his bed and he walked and it was obviously it was noticeable that is why the jews spoke to him but even after that you know jesus does like a post deliverance ministry we call it where you spend time with the person who has been healed and you tell them okay god is uh, showing me that these these things led to your sickness so you know you be uh, careful about it how about you know you you uh, uh, going for counseling or in different things post care post deliverance care we we say so jesus gave him that advice and told him if you want to live free of the sickness throughout your life please don't go back to the old way of sinning okay now the other thing that we see in this situation is the jews and their response was the healing real yes that is why they noticed and they saw uh, the man walking but what are they telling this man you know they are telling him how come you are carrying your bed on the sabbath okay who is this person who told you to carry your bed on on the sabbath day because according to their customs it was not a good thing right to uh, carry your bed and they had certain rules regulations traditions so we can look at the jews and say they had a religious spirit okay and that religious spirit was stopping them from seeing the goodness of god what had god done god had healed a sick person who was sick for 38 years now that's a matter to rejoice about isn't it but you notice that the jews are upset about what about some tradition you know the religious spirit in us causes us to do that we don't appreciate what god is doing we are upset about what god should be doing and he's not doing right so they were angry with whoever that man is okay but later on this uh, a sick man who got healed he goes and tells him hey it's actually jesus jesus was the one who told me to take up my bed on the sabbath day and you know that would have been very very uh, like you know the for the jews it's like oh this jesus come on what is he doing on the sabbath day okay so the jews persecuted jesus and they got so upset we are told they sought to kill him just think about it somebody got healed wouldn't we be happy about that but the religious spirit religious spirit cannot see what is right what god has done right but what does the religious spirit see the tradition has not been kept okay so they are so upset that they are ready to kill jesus for what for the things he had done on the sabbath that is more important for them sabbath but jesus answered them and he said look my father has been working until now and i have been working so jesus is explaining how he is co-laboring with the father okay so you understand the relationship of the trinity there is working together there is harmony you know one is not working against the other they are working together and today even today the holy spirit holy spirit will work together with what the father is doing what the son is you know uh, uh, what what to glorify the son that's what we read so they all work together they don't work against each other and notice here it says my father has been working until now so it, it's showing us that god is interested in mankind and god is um, you know serving right god is serving god is watching we read in other scriptures he never sleeps nor slumbers he does not even need any rest and god is so keen on on doing what he needs to do that he is working is working until now and i have also been working so jesus is working along with the father and jesus is talking about this more in terms of you know what he was releasing on the earth at that time which is 
the, these signs and healings and miracles and all of that. So when Jesus says this, the Jews get even more upset. They're like, ah, now we have to kill this man. Okay. First, what did he do? He broke the Sabbath. He didn't keep the traditions. Now he's telling that God is his father. So when we say that God is our father, we are equating ourselves with God. So for the Jews, it was blasphemy because God is so great. How can we say that we are sons and daughters of God? You know, that also was an alien thought to the Jews. So they took two reasons. One is Sabbath. He broke the Sabbath. Second, he is equating himself with God. Blasphemy. This man is not a lawful man. So they are really getting worked up against Jesus. But Jesus is trying to tell them. He answered them. Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. Now, Jesus is not getting flustered at all. He told them that, you know, uh, the father is working or God is my father. Boldly, he's repeating the same thing. And he's saying, look, the son, which is me, I can't even do anything of myself. Meaning, you see the relationship within the Trinity. They're depending on each other. So whatever the father does, only that I can do. Okay. So whatever the son sees the father doing, that's the only thing that he does. So in other words, you know what Jesus was saying? He was saying, you're blaming me for healing this man on the Sabbath. You know what? I did that healing because the father did that healing. So in other words, he was kind of saying, don't blame me. You blame the father. He did it. He performed the healing. I saw it. I went and did it. Right? So he's showing the Jews that he's that much in sync with the father, that he only does what he sees the father do. Now we could even ask the question, the pool of Bethesda, we read that many people were there, blind, lame, paralyzed. Why is it that Jesus only went to this man, 38 years, un not healed? Jesus is giving the answer. He's saying, look, I can do many things. Whatever I like, I can do. But I'm not doing everything. I wait on the Father. Father showed me that this man needed to be healed. So I went and did it. So it's a lesson for us in our lives. You know, there are a lot of good things we can do. But what is important? Father's will. God will show us. Huh, okay, you know, Dave, this is what I want you to do. This is what the father is doing. And he's revealing it to Dave. So out of the 10 good works in front of him, the father is doing, the, you know, number four. Dave should do that. Because that is what pleases the father. The same way Jesus is telling the Jews, you know why I healed this man? Because the father showed me. Why are you getting upset with me? Why are you getting angry with me? You know, he's kind of trying to give them an explanation. Okay, let's move on. Then he says, for the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. So Jesus is not getting scared at all. He's continuing on the same loop. And he's saying, yeah, he's my father. He loves me. He shows me uh, what, what he wants me to do. So now he's saying, father loves me. The father loves the son. So it's all the more upsetting for the Jews. And he also says, for as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. So, you know, he's also talking about like resurrection life, which is given by the father, which can be released by the son also. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. Now he's also talking about authority, which has been given to the son. Okay. And we know that, you know, at the end of uh, the ages, it is Jesus who is going to judge. Isn't it? He is going to judge. And uh, so, even judgment, the authority for judgment has been given to the son. So he's describing the Trinity and he's helping the Jews understand, I'm not an ordinary son. I'm loved by the father. Judgment has been given to me. I am co-laboring with the father. 
I have a relationship, a strong relationship with the father. Whatever he is doing, I am doing. So, like, why are you blaming me? I am only following what the father is telling me to do. So, uh, you know, Jesus is trying to clarify these things to the Jews. That all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. So he's telling them two points I told you. They were upset that Sabbath was not kept. And they were upset that Jesus was uh, equating himself with the father. Now what is Jesus' explanation? It's not that I didn't keep the Sabbath. The father told me to heal, so I healed. So you decide whom you want to blame. Me or, you know, <laughs> so indirectly he's saying... Come on, you are trying to be upset with God. It's I'm not at fault here. And then he's also saying that, yes, I am equating myself with the father. But he's not taking the position of the father. He's clearly taking another position, which is that of a son. But he's explaining the relationship of the Trinity. And he's saying, I'm not at all trying to hide my relationship with the father. If it upsets you, let it upset you. The father loves me. He shows me what he's doing. I do only what I see the father do. The father has given me the right to judge. If you don't honor me, then, you know, uh, you're not honoring the father who sent me. Because why are you so passionate about the Sabbath? To honor Jeho Jehovah God, isn't it? It's that same God who's honoring me. Why are you not honoring me? So, it's, it's like Jesus is explaining, but it's all the more offensive for the Jews. Okay, he moves on. And again, you know, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has every everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. So Jesus is preaching to them. You know, Jesus is like how Peter he took every opportunity to preach the gospel. Jesus is preaching about himself and he's saying, look, you know what you need? You need to believe in me because when you believe in me, uh, you will have everlasting life, right? And you will pass on from death to life. So he's explaining salvation to them. And most, he's saying, most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So, you know, he is talking, you could say that it's kind of figurative, like spiritually dead. They will rise up. Uh, and you could also say that, you know, when the resurrection from the dead happens, even at that time, who is going to lead that troop? It is the Son of God. Who is? the Lord Jesus. So that also will happen under the leadership of the Son of God. So he says, as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. So he's saying, look, the Trinity, every, every uh, person in the Trinity, they are the source of life, the Father, the Son, right? Uh, so you have to put your trust in God. You have to put your trust in the Father. Put your trust in me because the Father is the one who sent me. And he says, uh, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can do nothing. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the father who sent me. So in so many words, Jesus has described that he is the son of God. He is related to the father in a very close way. And he's co-laboring with the father and that the father has given him also the authority, right? Great authority to judge, to raise the dead. So many things. So Jesus is trying to explain to the Jews that he is the son of God. It's like, you know, he, he himself is presenting his case so that the Jews will believe him. And he'll continue, okay? He'll continue to say. 
and you know he says if i bear witness of myself my witness is not true there is another who bears witness of me and i know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true you have sent to john and he has borne witness to the truth yet i do not receive testimony from man but i say these things that you may be saved he was the burning and shining lamp and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light but i have greater witness than john's for the works which the father has given me to finish the very works that i do bear witness of me that the father has sent me so he's convincing the jews right so so far he talked about his relationship with the father now he talks about the witness right there is a, what who is a witness a witness is somebody who will testify that yeah this person is um this genuine okay this person you you can um, or validating the individual so jesus is uh, telling that he is genuine he is the son of god now what are the witnesses for that he chooses to talk about john the baptist because to some extent you know people respected john the baptist they respected him as a prophet you know he came before jesus as a forerunner inviting people to repentance so people believed his word so he says look even john spoke about me right why is it that you don't believe what john said so he says okay fine you don't want to believe what john said let me show you a better witness i have a better witness because you know when you're trying to prove a case people bring in witnesses the best possible witness why because with the help of the witness you can prove this is you know this person is innocent or this person is a uh, that you must con convict the, the you know the the wrong doer so a good witness is very important to prove the case you know whichever way the case goes okay so jesus is saying i'm telling you john is a good witness believe him but you're not believing even john you're not believing come on let me give you a better witness and you know what that better witness is it's in verse 36 jesus says i have greater witness than john for the works which the father has given me to finish the very works that i do bear witness of me that the father has sent me so what is the greater witness than john the baptist the supernatural works that jesus did you know we said right after every miracle the disciples believed uh, the the people believed in some area they believed the noble man believed on the basis of what the works the works that jesus did so jesus is saying at least look at the works the man at the pool of bethesda was healed why can't you receive it but what is happening to the jews hard heart religious spirit these things will stop people from understanding and seeing and appreciating the works of the father so jesus said look i have healed that's the work of the father that itself is showing you that i am the son of god but you are not able to see it so the greater witness is the supernatural works of jesus and he's saying and the father himself who sent me has testified of me you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and these are they which testify of me but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life so it's a very sad state of affairs but jesus is saying you have the scriptures you're following the traditions you're keeping the rituals okay you're honoring the law all this is supposed to be done so that you can relate well with god isn't it but how sad after doing all this you still don't know me after doing all this you still don't know god is it possible that uh, we follow everything and we still don't know god yes it is possible 
when we have a religious spirit, we can get caught up in the practices. We can even read the scripture. It says, see, uh, you search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. We might be so close to God but still miss God. Because you know, we are not receiving like a childlike heart. We are not receiving you know, Jesus as Christ. We are not receiving his miracles. When he's doing the miracles, what should be our response? What will be the response of a child? You tell me. 38 years, a man couldn't walk. What would a child say? Wow, this person could not walk. Amazing. God, thank you. You have done a miracle. That is the response which God is looking for. But the Jews, hard heart, religious spirit, they're not saying thank you to God. Instead, they're calling that healed man and saying, who, who did this today's Sabbath? How dare that person heal you? How come you're carrying your bed? How sad, no? All the wrong focus, wrong questions are being asked from that man. But Jesus is saying, look, okay, even if you don't believe me, look at the works. They are the greater witness. If you don't believe John the Baptist, okay, no problem. Look, I'm doing the miracles. Why can't you see that I am the son of God? So are miracles important? Are supernatural works of God important? Very, very important. Because Jesus is saying, they are the witness. So what is the witness? That Jesus is the Christ, the works that he did. Okay, so it's important for us to see, you know, uh, that power demonstrated in different ways. Even today, we must desire in our church, in our ministry, when we pray for somebody, when we are leading worship, we must ask God, God, let your supernatural works be released. Because when it happens in people's lives, what happens? And then they believed. They will believe. But let the works of God be done in their lives. Okay. So now Jesus moves on and he says, look, you people, you are only about, uh, you know, um, uh, just encouraging one another. You actually don't care about God. And he tells about himself, my honor, I, I don't receive honor from men. You have seen the supernatural work, but not once you're saying, wow, you know, God is working through you. But Jesus says it doesn't matter to me because I don't receive my honor from men. And he says, but I know you people, you know, that you don't have love of God in you. I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not, do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is no one who accuses you. Moses in whom, for there is one who accuses you, Moses in whom you trust. So basically he's saying, look, you are ready to believe anyone else. Okay. When it is convenient. Because in your own circle, uh, you you will, you know, kind of be given, you will be lifted up. So you're ready to believe as long as you get honor from men. But I'm not like that. I don't receive my honor from men. And he says, I don't even have to condemn you. You know what? You want to uphold the law, right? And the law came through Moses. Let me tell you, even that Moses believes in me. So I don't have to condemn you. Moses, in whom you trust, he, he himself will need to accuse you because you're not seeing that I'm the Messiah. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So you see, this passage is very important. That's why I kind of read every verse. Okay, we won't be reading uh, verses, you know, so much in the future, but I wanted you all to see what Jesus is saying, you know, about his relationship with the father, about the importance of miracles, about hard heartedness of the Jews and how, you know, they missed things were happening in front of their eyes, but because of the condition of their hearts, 
they missed the beautiful works of God. And Jesus is saying, how sad. The very things that you say you want to uphold and the very person that you're trying to honor, who would be Moses? Moses himself will condemn you because you have missed the point. You know, it's possible, right? We miss the point and we go around the bush like the Israelites walking through the wilderness. So these Jews were also doing the same thing, walking round and round, missing the point. And Jesus is telling, I don't know. I don't know what to do with all of you. I'm trying to explain to you that I'm the Messiah. You have been waiting for me. And when I have come, you're not ready to receive. At least believe the supernatural works which I am doing. Okay. So I'm just going to pause here. Any additional thoughts, any comments from your side? Anything that you learned, anything fresh that has come to your mind today? You could share and then, you know, we can wrap up today's class. Okay, so I think you just want to take it all in, which is fine. So just once again, a class, I just want to uh, clarify because I, I, I showed you Bethsaida. So please don't get confused. I'll show you the map quickly. Uh, pool of Bethesda. Okay, Bethesda, very different from Bethsaida. So it was a confusion in my head. So it got transferred to you. But I would like to clarify with an apology. So Gal Galilee, come back here. Judea. So where did all this happen? In Jerusalem, in the pool of Bethesda. So we are not talking about Bethsaida. Okay. So please remember that. Yep. Okay, wonderful. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. I uh, just want to request somebody to pray, please. And we are ready to go to the next class. Okay, I keep asking Kiran. So, Thomas. Oh. <laughs> yeah, please. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. We praise you. We bless your holy name. Father, as we heard, gospel, if you share to one person, we don't know how much influence that person to many, Father. Help us to share the gospel, Father, one on one person, oh Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We learn many things. How religious spirit, how the tradition will, 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 will disturb the spirit of God and move of God, Father. We thank you, Father. We praise you. Father, help us to come out of the tradition and religious spirit and move in the spirit of God, oh Lord. We thank you. We praise you, Father. We bless you. For all the miracles, it build the faith and they they come to believe in you, Father. Let me walk with the miracle, O Lord. In our ministries, let the miracles will be manifest in Jesus' name, Father. As your word says, you preach, I'll prove with the word. Father, when we preach the word, let the word will be manifest with the signs, wonders, and miracles. Healings will take place, Father. Father, I pray for each and everyone in this place. When they minister, let the miracles happen. Let the miracle happen. And every religious spirit and tradition will be broken. And Jesus' name will be lifted high. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. God bless you, everyone. Yeah. You carry on. And I'll connect with you in your next class. Okay. Have a very blessed day. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. See you. Thank you. Bye. See you, Dave. Bye.